Hello and welcome to Swiftly Spoken, a fan-made Taylor Swift podcast in which we analyse her artistry, including her lyricism, music videos and even full album retrospectives. We are your hosts, Lisa and Cameron, and in this second episode, we're going to be breaking down the lyrics and backstory of The Last Great American Dynasty. Okay, so first we'll be starting off by giving some general song details, including how it was created and what Taylor has said about the song itself. Then we'll give a brief overview of Rebecca Harkness's life. And then we shall go into discussing specific details and anecdotes as they appear in the song lyrics, clarifying if some are facts and some are folklore. And finally, we'll wrap up by giving some information about Taylor's own history with the house. Okay, so first we'll discuss some general kind of information and details about The Last Great American Dynasty. So obviously it's the third track on Taylor's Ape Studio album Folklore, which was released on the 24th of July in 2020. The song was solely written by Taylor and was inspired by the American philanthropist Rebecca Harkness. Aaron Dessner also produced and composed the song. So The Last Great American Dynasty um, is sung from a third person perspective and it provides a satirical anecdote of Rebecca Harkness while also drawing parallels between Taylor's and Rebecca's lives. The song received acclaim from music critics who praised the song's lyricism, plot, production, calling it a standout on folklore. Right, so before getting into how the song came about, I just wanted to ask Cameron, what were your first reactions to the song? How did you feel about it? Oh, I loved it when I first listened to it. It was kind of quite cool to hear a kind of um, this story of someone that wasn't Taylor for once. Folklore was kind of the first yeah. album where, you know, all the songs weren't um, kind of necessarily personal to Taylor. But also it was at the end, it was kind of a shock of like, oh, it is, mm -hmm. it relates to Taylor as well. And I think also... Um, none of us, like, as a kind of fandom, had ever really explored Rebecca Harkness that much. So it's quite cool to learn about this person's life that was so rich and interesting. So I, yeah. I, I absolutely love the song on first listen and still love it now. Um, yeah, for sure. I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, I especially get kind of emotional when I hear that twist. I don't know what it is, mm. but it's just such an amazing way to put some character and you, you don't expect that suddenly the character is so connected to Taylor in a way. I thought it was just really, really cleverly written and I really did enjoy it and I still do. Yes. Getting into how the song came about, Aaron Desner gave an interview with Vulture on the 27th of July, 2020, where he gave some interesting quotes about the song itself. Firstly, he said, I wrote that after we'd been working for a while. It was an attempt to write something attractive, more up-tempo and kind of pushing. I also was interesting lattice work of electric guitars. They come in and sort of pull you along, kind of reminiscent of Big Red Machine. Big Red Machine, of course, being his group with Justin Vernon. He goes on to say that Taylor immediately clicked with that. Initially, I was imagining these dreamlike distant electric guitars and electronics, but with an element of folk. I sent it before I went on a run. And when I got back from the run, that song was there. So with that quote, we can see that Taylor really worked quickly on this. And he goes on to say, it's almost like a song would come out like a lightning bolt. And we can see that as well with when she wrote Cardigan. He sent her it and a few hours later, he got a whole, a whole song back, basically, which really goes to show just how inspired Taylor felt by his music. Finally, he stated that she told me the story behind it, which sort of recounts the narrative of Rebecca Harkness. She was infamous for not fitting in entirely in society. That story at the end becomes personal. Eventually, Taylor bought that house. I think that it's symptomatic of folklore, this type of narrative song. I think it's so interesting how um, fast this song came about and the fact that he went on a run and when he came back, the song was done. Like, that's just yep. crazy and just kind of, like you said earlier, highlights Taylor's kind of amazing songwriting talent. Okay, so Taylor was interviewed by Entertainment Weekly in 2020, and she discussed how kind of the last great American dynasty and folklore as a whole came about. And she said that at the beginning of quarantine, she started to watch lots of films and started to consume other people's stories. Um, and she realized that she had never really created characters and with these intersecting storylines, so decided that that was what she was going to do. Taylor was asked by Entertainment Weekly magazine about when she first started to learn about Rebecca Harkness. And she said that she learned about her as soon as she walked through her former Rhode Island home. Taylor said that I got the home when I was in my early 20s as a place for my family to congregate and be together. I was told about her, I think, by the real estate agent who was walking me through the property. As soon as I found out about her, I wanted to know everything I could, so I started reading. I found her so interesting, 
And then as more parallels begin to develop between our lives, being that the lady lives in the house on the hill that everyone gets to gossip about, I was always looking for an opportunity to write about her, and I finally found it. In addition to this, in the Folklore Long Pond sessions, Taylor also said that she'd wanted to write a track about Rebecca since 2013, but just never kind of found the right kind of track to do it. Um, so it's interesting that on Folklore and with Aaron, she finally was able to tell Rebecca's kind of story and properly kind of release and write this song, which she's been wanting to write since 2013. Now that we've seen what Taylor and Aaron have said about this song, we're going to give some information about Rebecca Harkness herself, just to give some background details to make the song a bit more understandable. To preface this, a lot of this information, as well as many of the anecdotes that we'll be giving when we break down the lyrics, come from a book called Blue Blood. This is a 1988 biography written by a man called Craig Unger, which basically tells the life of Rebecca Harkness. Unfortunately, this book is now out of print. However, the spread that Unger initially wrote for the New York magazine in 1983, which prompted him to ultimately write the full book, is still available. So if you're interested in this, we'll be linking it in our episode extras, which we upload onto our Instagram. Our Instagram is at Swiftly Spoken Podcast. So an interesting quote from the spread itself that may have partly inspired Taylor when it came to naming the song The Last Great American Dynasty is... The demise of this great American family dynasty resulted from more than eccentricity and bad investments, for, for the intrigue extended far beyond the internal politics of the Harkness Ballet into Rebecca's tragic personal life. Finally, it's interesting to mention that there have recently been talks of reprinting the book, and many Swifties showed an interest and they actually contacted the writer Craig Unger, who tweeted out recently saying that he was in contact with his publishers to see if it could be reprinted. Now, if it was reprinted, Cameron, would you like to give it a read? How do you feel about that? A hundred percent, like a hundred percent. I'm a history student, so I love delving into people's lives and kind of working out their kind of, especially someone that has such a rich life and also someone that, for someone that had such a rich life, there's not really that much on her. So I mm. would love to be able to kind of have that book and properly read it and delve into this story even more because I think it's absolutely fascinating. So yeah, no, I would totally would. I totally, totally would. Yeah, I think there was, there was quite an interest, it seemed. And I definitely do recommend whether this gets printed or not. I do recommend the spread. It's about 15 or 16 pages. It's really interesting. It's kind of like a summary of what the whole book was, but it gives a lot of details that obviously we can't mention in this episode because we'd go on for hours and hours but there's a lot of cool facts about her family and some sad stories as well um but yeah definitely recommended so with that being said let's get into a summary of rebecca's life so she was born rebecca semple west in st louis missouri in 1915 to a very wealthy family her nickname coincidentally was betty which is really funny and a strange coincidence considering there is another song on folklore called betty but I don't think they have anything to do with each other. No, I don't think so either. They, the, it was all the kind of um, the folklore love triangle were all named after um, Ryan Reynolds and... Um, Blake Lively. Blake Lively's children. So yeah, it's, it's a definitely yeah. a nice coincidence. But Yeah, it's just one of those moments that there's a lot of moments throughout folklore that there's these strange coincidences that yeah, really they work out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So anyway, she was born to a very wealthy family. They were very prim and proper, and they kind of expected her to follow certain standards. She was expected to be a debutante. She was expected to get married to a person that they kind of lined up for her to get married to, and basically follow the rules that they'd set up. However, she was a bit of a rebel. Um, she had a lot of interest in ice skating and dancing, and she wanted to study ballet, but she was stopped by her father. If we fast forward a little bit, in October of 1947 is when she marries William Hale Harkness, who is nicknamed in the song itself, Bill. Now, he, as Taylor mentioned, was the heir to Standard Oil. So basically, he came from a very, very rich family and they got married. At this point, Rebecca seemed to be quite happy in her personal life as well, as she started to get involved with the arts. She was able to dabble in music, sculpting, painting and dance. However, the happiness kind of ended when William tragically died in 1954, leaving Rebecca as his heir, and she became one of the richest women in America at that point. Though she went on to marry a couple of times after William died, it seemed that Rebecca was basically still besotted with him, 
and she always changed her name back or, or kept her name as Harkness. After his death and the inheritance of this large fortune, she basically began to indulge in a lot of luxury. She travelled a lot, she bought a lot of properties, she started renovating the Holiday House, and she became a patron of arts. So at this point she was truly immersed in the world of dance and music, which has always been, had always been a passion of hers. In 1959, she established the Rebecca Harkness Foundation, which subsidised arts and dance, and she created the Holiday House Art Centre. She also sponsored the Joffrey Ballet for a few years. She would invite the whole company to Watch Hill for the summer. Uh, she would buy them outfits or anything they needed. And a while after that, she began her own company called the Harkness Ballet. Now, this split from the Joffrey Ballet to creating her own ballet was quite controversial. She was attacked quite a lot by the media. There was a lot of criticism. Basically, they had different ideas. She wanted more creative freedom. So she kind of broke away from him and it, it attracted a lot of negative press. Apart from dance and ballet, she also sponsored the construction of medical research buildings at the New York Hospital through the William Hale Harkness Foundation. Uh, which also prompted a lot of medical research projects. However, towards the end of her life, all of this money and all of this fame kind of was a double-edged sword for her because she no longer knew who to trust exactly, it became more of a burden to her, and that's why she had kind of a tumultuous relationship with a couple of other men, she was divorced, she took on lovers, some people double-crossed her, so it really became a, more of a burden than a help to her. Finally, she did die of stomach cancer in 1982 at the age of 67. So all in all, her life was very interesting. It's very curious to see how she spent all of that money that she inherited. And something that was integral to her was, of course, ballet. An interesting fact is that it seems that there is an upcoming documentary film called An American Ballet Story, which is in the works, which apparently is going to explore Rebecca Harkness's legacy and her company, Harkness Ballet. So we should keep our eyes out for that if you're interested in dance or in Rebecca Harkness herself, who is quite an interesting woman. OK, so next we'll be moving on to the lyric breakdown section of this podcast, where we'll be analysing the lyrics and properly pulling them apart and discussing their meanings, while also just talking about some of the things that Taylor and Aaron have said about specific parts of the song or lyrics. And we'll also be giving more details about Rebecca's life as they crop up in the song and discussing whether some of the rumours about her life are fact or folklore. To begin, Taylor introduces us in the first verse to the main protagonist of this song, Rebecca, obviously referring to Rebecca Harkness, who we've already given an overview of. She is described to be travelling towards her salt box house on the coast. So what exactly is a salt box house? Well, it's described as a traditional New England designed house, which basically has a sloping roof, which means that the house kind of has two stories at the front and one at the back. And this is said to take her mind off of St. Louis. As we've discussed, Rebecca was originally from St. Louis. She was born and raised there. However, she kind of would want to take her mind off of it because it seems that she had an unhappy upbringing there. We've already discussed how strict her family were with her. Also, they were kind of detached from her. It looks like she was raised by a nanny mostly. So yeah, definitely was thinking to happier times in her holiday house. After that, we're introduced to the second character in this song, which is Bill. So we've already discussed that Bill is the shortened name for William Harkness. Uh, he was 15 years older than Rebecca. And as we've said, he was the heir to standard, the Standard Oil fortune, which he inherited from his family. And here we start with the rumours. So here we have the town stating, how did a middle class divorcee do it? Rebecca, of course, was a divorcee. She had been married previously to getting married to William Harkness. She had got married at 24 to Charles Dickinson Walsh Pierce, who basically was someone that her family knew of, and they kind of pushed her into it to some extent. Basically, a quote from her kind of describes how she felt about this marriage. She said, as soon as I walked down the aisle, I knew that I had made a terrible, terrible mistake. Uh, so eventually she was divorced from him in 1945, a few years before meeting and marrying William. 
Their marriage, however, seemed to be quite a happy one. One of the interesting facts that I read was that they even wrote a song together called Giggling With My Feet, which I don't know what that would be about, but it's certainly an interesting title. Yeah, definitely, definitely, um, I, I, yeah, an odd one. <laughs> yeah. So essentially, this first verse gives us an overview of Rekka and Bill. In the second verse, we're then introduced to where they live. Holiday House is the centre and inspiration of the story. It was the home to Rebecca and William, and later her ballet company, and a host of famous entourage that she had. And after that, eventually, it became Taylor's. Uh, after Rebecca was widowed, she renovated the house, and as a curious fact, she added eight kitchens and 21 bathrooms. 21? Why would you want 21 bathrooms? It is crazy. Like, it's <laughs> just nuts. And... How many kitchens? Eight. Eight. Eight kitchens, gosh. <laughs> How the rich and famous live, eh? Finally, in this verse, we're given the conclusion to Rebecca and Bill's marriage when he does pass away. So, though Bill had had previous heart attacks, his heart did eventually give out and he passed away, as we previously mentioned, leaving Rebecca Harkness as the heir to his fortune. This, of course, led many people to speculate over whether it was her fault, whether the parties did him in, uh, and the town basically had a lot to say about it. This verse kind of concludes the introduction to the holiday house where Rebecca and Bill lived. And apparently this is a story, as Cameron mentioned, that Taylor always wanted to tell. And it's also a story that she would tell to many of her friends, right? Yeah, so in the Entertainment Weekly magazine interview that I talked about earlier, Taylor said that she likes to tell all of her friends about Rebecca and the holiday house. And she stated that anyone that's been there before knows that I do the tour, in quotes, where I show everyone through the house and I tell them different anecdotes about each room because I've done that much research on this house and on this woman, so in every single room there's a different anecdote about Rebecca Harkness. Taylor also said that it's just endlessly entertaining to her that this fabulous woman lived there. Taylor finishes by saying she did whatever she wanted. And yeah, so no, it's interesting that Taylor also has had a fascination with Rebecca and this house and done so much research into her and just loves, it's, it's nice that she kind of loves the history of that house and really embraces it and really feels like she is part of it. Yeah, for sure. And I, I guess it must be such an interesting tour to go on around the house with all of these anecdotes. Yes, I think it would be a pretty cool tour and um, definitely something that um, would be amazing to kind of experience Taylor talking about Rebecca in this house and her kind of fascination with her. Next, we head into the chorus of the song, uh, which we've already spoken about includes the name of the song, The Last Great American Dynasty, which maybe could have been inspired by the quote by Craig Unger, which we discussed earlier. Either way, the chorus basically is from the point of view of the nosy neighbours gossiping about Rebecca. However, Rebecca, during her life at least, didn't really seem to care about what people said about her. There was a quote that I read uh, about Rebecca herself uh, where she said that she had always vowed to do everything bad. She loved kind of causing scandal in a way, so to a certain extent she didn't really mind what they had to say about her. And I think that's one of the characteristics that Taylor kind of really likes about Rebecca. In fact, Taylor mentioned that I don't think we often hear about women who did whatever the hell they wanted. So it's kind of refreshing to just hear like this woman just went out, she had a good time and she didn't really care about what they said about her. Yeah, because um, in Taylor's interview with Time, she also talked to them about um, one of the last lines of the chorus, which is she had a marvellous time ruining everything. And Taylor said that she's really proud of that line because it's about what happens when a woman kind of steps out of the cages and runs. And I think it's interesting that Taylor is really fascinated with how Rebecca just did not care what people said. And I mm -hmm. think Taylor really relates with that. And um, it's interesting that she um, explores that in this song. Yeah, this is definitely an interesting song from the perspective of just a woman who went out and she just did what she wanted. And Taylor mentions that that could be a real pearl clutching moment for society when a woman just owns her desires and wilderness. And it was then and it is now. And it kind of parallels how sometimes Taylor, through her actions, has kind of been judged just, just for being a woman, just for wanting to do whatever she wanted to do. Another interesting thing that she said is that Sometimes, you know, by ruffling feathers and raising eyebrows, Rebecca became the talk of the town. But you know what? She she decided there were marvellous times to be had. 
and that was more important. And I think that's a brilliant way to summarise the song. In the following verse, we have a few anecdotes and details about Rebecca Harkness's life that we're going to classify into facts or folklore. Uh, so firstly, we are basically told about how Rebecca kind of gives up on the people in Rhode Island and invites her bitch pack friends from the city into Holiday House. Now, Cameron, what do you think? Bitch pack, fact or folklore? I think that is fact. I think that that's what they actually called themselves, if I'm correct. Yes, you are correct. It is a fact. So the Bitch Pack were basically a group of friends formed by Rebecca and uh, her fellow debutantes. Uh, they created it when they graduated and yeah, they were named the Bitch Pack. Now, here's some of the things that they did. Uh, they enjoyed breaking rules a lot and basically uh, subverting society's expectations of them. So a couple of the things that they did, they laced a punch ball with mineral oil. They also uh, stripped on the dining tables. So there you go. Another interesting thing about the bitch pack is it really mirrors and parallels Taylor's squad of friends. Uh, do you think she mentioned them on purpose? Maybe, yeah. Again, I suppose because the song is kind of, um, is drawing parallels between hers and Rebecca's lives, I think Taylor definitely purposefully included that um because obviously it does parallel with the whole the squad um taylor swift's kind of friendship group so yeah i think definitely that is um a kind of really interesting parallel and definitely something that i think taylor would have um noticed between her and rebecca yeah she also got a lot of shit for having a squad <laughs> yes definitely like i think it's a shame because um i think in a rolling uh, taylor swift's rolling stone interview in 2019 she talked about how um she just kind of created it as this kind of um, this group of women that were kind of standing together and that, you know, women can stand together. But unfortunately, I think it the media kind of twisted it and it got turned into yeah. this exclusive group that you couldn't yeah. be a part of. Whereas I think initially the whole idea was that anyone can be a part. And, it, you know, it's for women to feel like they have a group of friends. But I think, yeah, it's a shame that it kind of got twisted. Um, a mm, bit. I, I um, agree. I think it was very misconstrued. But there you go. That's kind of what this song is about in a way. Yes. The next line says that Rebecca filled the pool with champagne. Fact or folklore? I guess this is another fact. Okay, so in this case, there is debate. So we're going to have to class classify it as folklore. Uh, she's actually rumoured to have cleaned the pool with champagne. Next, we have that she blew her money on boys and ballet. I think this is kind of an easy one, but fact or folklore? Fact. Yeah. So in fact, she, as we mentioned before, she would love to shower her dancers with gifts. She was also rumoured to have many lovers who she also treated quite well. So yeah, she did spend her money on those two things. Finally, we have a mention to Dali, which refers to the artist Salvador Dali. They became friends and she bought a lot of art from him, a lot of expensive art. And one standout piece that she bought is the Chalice of Life, which cost her $250,000. It's basically an urn, it's quite a small urn, which eventually her ashes were placed into. And we'll be posting a picture of it, but basically it's not your typical urn, it's like gold, it has butterflies all over it, it's fancy. <laughs> so after this we have a repetition of the chorus, the only change we have is uh, to shameless woman this town has ever seen. Uh, but again, continuation of gossip and rumours. Uh, and then we move into the bridge, which is another interesting part of the song. Here we have a very debated lyric. She stole his dog and dyed it key lime green. So what do you think? Fact, folklore, have you heard about the debates? I think I have. So I think it's folklore. I don't think, I think there's kind of a bit of a debate of whether it is in fact a dog or another animal, but I can't remember which one. Yep. Yeah, you got it. So there is, uh, it is folklore because according to what I read, uh, it was actually rumoured to be a cat that she dyed key lime green. So some people have said that Taylor may have changed it to dog since she loved cats. But to be honest with you, I think that these changes were kind of purposeful because the point of folklore was kind of to gather up stories and as stories are passed down, things sometimes change. So I think this is one of those moments where you can't always rely exactly on what is being said, but it still makes the story very interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that is definitely something that um, is a really cool thing to notice. And to be fair as well, maybe Kat didn't um, 
kind of sound maybe when yeah. it was sung maybe it didn't fit very well with uh, cat and then died maybe it sounded better with dog and died with the two yeah D's. yeah so yeah, maybe also it, maybe yeah it was also kind of a lyrical um thing and how it's pronounced maybe it was just easier but i also think maybe yeah the folklore um theme also is a really cool kind of maybe reason why um it was a dog rather than a cat Finally, we get the twist in this story, which we've already spoken about, when Taylor reveals her personal connection to the story, stating that the house, Holiday House, was then bought by her. So yeah, now we switch to first person narrative. And Taylor talked about this with Entertainment Weekly, the magazine interview that I talked about earlier. And she said that in her head, she'd always wanted to do a country music standard narrative device, which is where the first verse you sing about someone else, the second verse you sing about someone else who's even closer to you. And then in the third verse, you go, surprise, it was me. You bring it personal for the last verse. Taylor said that I always thought that if I were to tell that story, I wanted to include the similarities, our lives or our reputations or our scandals. And I think it's interesting how obviously Taylor talks about um, these parties and these these men and bad habits and these m- crazy women and then goes, it was bought by me. So, you know, it never now history is kind of repeating itself and such in a more in a jokey kind of um, tone. And with that, we conclude the breakdown of the lyrics. However, now we're going to move on to Taylor and the house, her history with Holiday House and how she kind of came about purchasing it and the scandals that she's been through with the house. Okay, so Taylor purchased the Rhode Island Holiday House for $17.75 million in 2013. It is now called High Watch, but it was obviously once called Holiday House, and it has eight bedrooms. For a while, when Taylor first moved in in 2013, she had a sign outside the front which said, I knew you were trouble when you walked in, no trespassing in capitals. Obviously, a nod to her song, I knew you were trouble, And I guess if locals didn't already know that Taylor lived there, they certainly did after this sign was put up. Locals started to um, criticise Taylor about living there and started to feel more negative towards her presence in Rhode Island and in the Holiday House. And I guess maybe her transparency about living there was something that maybe people didn't like because Taylor was putting herself out there and saying, look, I live here. I've even put a sign outside with one of my lyrics on. And what's quite interesting was when I was kind of doing research into the area around um, Holiday House, as mentioned earlier, a lot of old family, old money families live in this area. And I guess that these kind of more wealthy people like to keep themselves to themselves in this in this kind of tight knit group. So this kind Mm. of famous celebrity coming in and marking their territory of, look, I am here, you know, maybe rub them up the wrong way, I guess. Yeah, so Taylor and the state of Rhode Island have a very contentious history, much like Rebecca did. Um, And like I said, um, as soon as Taylor bought the house in 2013, there was grumblings from locals about Taylor's presence, um, the traffic that was created by fans wanting to visit and possibly meet Taylor at the house. And then locals also became frustrated with Taylor wanting to stake her claim on part of the beach that she rightfully owned. Um, And people kind of were very annoyed about this as people have been using it for years and they suddenly felt that part of the beach was taking away from them was taken away from them even though taylor like i said rightfully owned it um another controversy that um happened um was that taylor also wanted to rebuild the seawall that was part of her property and that leads onto the beach and people claimed that the um construction which would repair damage so if she was actually doing it to benefit the area would actually uh, locals were worried that it would impede public access and would ruin the popular surfing spot so there was lots of talks from locals about how Taylor was ruining the beach, even though she was just trying to um, repair damage that was done um, to the seawall by erosion. In addition, in 2015, um, the Rhode Island governor also proposed a tax on second homes in the state that were worth over a million dollars. Um, so this tax was um, named the Taylor Swift tax, which was inspired by Taylor's purchase. The uh, Rhode Island governor defended the proposal as they kind of um, suggested that it would add an extra $12 million to the state's economy. However, they decided to withdraw it. Um, also, Taylor held her secret sessions for the Reputation um, album at um, her Rhode Island home and she also brought in hordes of celebrities for her infamous 4th of July parties. Obviously these kind of parties parallel with the parties that Rebecca Harkness was having. Yeah yeah so Rebecca Harkness as we've mentioned before would bring in loads of famous her famous entourage which included Salvador Dali, all of her ballet dancers and she would 
uh, hold extravagant parties, which really, really do mimic the 4th of July parties that Taylor held there. They were a, a big attraction. Yes, they were. Like, they obviously ran from 2013 to 2016. And like I said, they were kind of, these very famous um talked about massively by the media and lots of fans used to flock there during that um kind of um during the fourth of july um period in the hopes to possibly spot taylor or one of these kind of fans but what's interesting is that obviously these don't happen anymore and even though this has nothing to do obviously with the house um i thought it'd be interesting to mention why taylor doesn't have these parties anymore so um, if you were around in 2017, um, you would have seen that the giant blow up, blow up slide that became famous from her 2016 Fourth of July party was actually erected by the pool. However, neither Taylor or any of her friends showed up. It was just Taylor's dad, Scott, and what looked like some of his friends kind of sat in the garden. And the reason for this is Taylor talked about in her um, Rolling Stone um, magazine interview. She said that her disillusionment with America led her to stop holding these parties. Okay, so as Lisa mentioned earlier, these kind of 4th of July parties that Taylor used to hold during 2013 to 2016, obviously parallel with the type of parties that Rebecca Harkness was having. And Julie Tremaine for Vulture on the 28th of July 2020 wrote a really interesting article about this. And she stated that Taylor did exactly the kind of things that a modern day Rebecca Harkness would have done. Harkness may have filled her pool with champagne and not flamingo and unicorn pool floats, but she bought celebrities of her day and she installed a dome on her lawn as a rehearsal space for her ballet company. It made the neighbours furious. In my head, that dome looks exactly like the enormous 27-foot-tall water slide that Taylor had for her 2016 extravaganza. The parallels between the two of them are strong enough that it's hard not to hear the lyric Rebecca gave up on the Rhode Island set forever as Swift's own feelings towards her home state. I think it's really interesting, um, this parallel, and um, I definitely think that um, this quote is kind of sums up this entire song about the parallels between Rebecca and Taylor and I think why Taylor has related so much to Rebecca. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It really, really ties everything together in a nice bow. Um, there's a lot of similarities between them and I think Taylor was able to uh, write that really nicely in this song. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's interesting as well as how um, just, and it's almost a bit like with Rebecca, even just her presence, no matter what she did, um, people criticised for just for being in that area because she wasn't deemed maybe as kind of respectful enough for the people of that area. And I guess it's similar with Taylor where, you know, no matter what she does, like trying to mend the seawall to benefit locals, mm. she's criticised for it because, you know, she's bringing unwanted attention to an area that people, you know, the people that live there lived quite quietly and peacefully. So it's very interesting, yeah. um, these kind of parallels. Before concluding, we really wanted to mention a quote that Jack uses to describe the song really nicely in the Folklore Long Pond sessions. So he says, that song is such a folklore moment for me because it's not about you, but it is about you. It's so deeply personal. And as we've discussed, this really shows how beautifully written the song is. Taylor really pulls back the lens and then zooms back in onto her personal life and does it in such a masterful way. With that, we have reached the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. We both really enjoyed looking into Rebecca's life and Taylor's history with the property, and it made it really cool to research and make this episode. If you did enjoy it, make sure to follow us on our social media profiles. On Instagram, we are at Swiftly Spoken Podcast, where we'll be uploaded some behind the scene pictures and information about the book that we mentioned so yeah make sure to check that out if you want to hear more from us make sure to follow us on spotify google podcast youtube we are also on another host of platforms that we have linked in our instagram so thank you very much and we'll see you next time mm -hmm.